BBC One, in a special edition of Heart of the Matter, Joan Bakewell examines the legacy of the bomb. Is there a moral justification for having nuclear weapons? And could there ever be a moral justification for using them? Does their very existence make the world a safer or more dangerous place? silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. Robert Oppenheimer led the team that created the first atom bomb, tested in New Mexico just three weeks before it was used on Hiroshima. Many scientists on the Manhattan Project had fled from war-torn Europe, but they soon became split over the morality of the scientific achievement. Edward Teller fundamentally disagreed with Oppenheimer. I believe that statement was morally wrong. I think he should have said, we have accomplished something new. Let all of us now See what is the most positive use we can make of it. He was out to frighten people. And that raised the whole morality issue. The morality resides in using positively what is being done. Another of the scientists working on the bomb was Joseph Rotblatt. He left the project late in 1944 when it became clear to him that the bomb wasn't to be used simply as a deterrent. I don't think that any, any good comes out from evil things. If, you speak, if one speaks about murder. just seemed to be such a simple idea with such an obvious application and no recognisable flaws. I couldn't see a reason why it would fail. It's a project at the end of the day and a product that will make a difference. It improves the quality of people's lives wherever it's going to be used. It's so obvious, I just can't understand why it hasn't been done before. That's it, good boy. Radio only exists because its inventor happened to watch a television program about Africa. To be honest, I could have been watching Come Dancing, if you understand me, and not that program about the spread of AIDS. And one of the things about being an inventor is that you always pick up on things, like on the word need. When, the, when somebody says there's a need for something, then, generally speaking, I, I get excited. The epidemic will spread rapidly across the developing world and beyond. I feel that we've got to start educating people on HIV and AIDS through radio. But there's problems in that A, there's no electricity, 
B, that the um, batteries are not always available for those people in country areas, even in, in the towns. Most extraordinary thing, apparently uh, people weren't able to get the important information about the spread of AIDS simply because they weren't listening to their radio. Radio, I think, is the one of the best ways of getting it across to them. They do listen to radio. They do listen to radio when they have batteries. The first thing I did was to go to my little studio, which is at the back of the house. I knew that an electric motor could be used in reverse as a generator. So I found a very small motor, which I then put into a hand brace. And then I was able to hitch up two wires from that motor to the back of a very cheap transistor radio. And then by turning the handle, I had the first bark of sound from a radio. And so that, if you like, was my eureka moment. Trevor's never been one for a quiet life. I was described as Rams is the second, Rams is two. Now, what I had to do for this particular act was to escape from a sarcophagus underwater. But before I went into the water in this sarcophagus, which is a very large box, like a coffin, um, they uh, roped me up, uh, blindfolded me, uh, put me into a sack, and then put a chain around the outside of the sack with a padlock on it. And then put me At the beginning of the 70s, Trevor worked as an escapologist in a Berlin circus. Now he lives on Eel Pie Island on the River Thames in West London. He built his house himself 20 years ago and it reflects his interest in life. The way in is through a well-equipped workshop at the back. And in the middle of the house is a swimming pool. Water has always played a big part in Trevor's life. As a youth, he was a champion swimmer, winning many awards and coming close to being selected for the National Olympic team of 1956. In the army for his national service, he became a physical training instructor, and afterwards he worked as a stuntman in films. Today, he makes swimming pools. And in his spare time, he invents things, like clockwork radios. I suppose it took three or four months uh, playing around with different types of springs and gears and so on until I reached the point where I was able to put this radio together. It's a box which contains a fairly powerful spring and then there's a gearbox that that spring drives and the gearbox then in turn drives a small generator which feeds electricity to this tiny radio and to make it work you simply wind the key, and now, you'll see it slowly unwinds, if I put the radio on, you see it produces that volume of sound. And there you have your clockwork radio. I would be delighted to bring my new invention to your offices so that I can demonstrate to you its capability. I wrote to Marconi, I wrote to Phillips, I wrote to British Petroleum, I wrote to National Power, I wrote to the Design Council, and they all said no. When I sent off to a particular company, each time I was waiting uh, with apprehension that this one, when it comes back, will be a favourable reply. And then, of course, when I was turned down, the feeling of rejection is, is, is awful, because now, of course, you've got to go again and again and again. And I was getting so frustrated and, in, in some cases, humiliated by the whole affair, thinking to myself that perhaps I've got it wrong and that perhaps I should give up. But once again, a television programme was about to play a crucial role in the development of the clockwork radio. This time it was the BBC's Tomorrow's World. Mm. And I've just combined them together. So what's inside all that? Well, what you've got is a box which contains uh, a fairly powerful spring. Mm. Um, this Immediately after the Tomorrow's World program, I was absolutely deluged with phone calls from all sorts of lovely people who simply phoned up to say, well done, Trev, my wife and I and the kiddies would like to say, bully bully, which, which was, you know, you can't imagine, just the feeling from those guys. Those people gave me more encouragement, ironically, than the big shots. Frustrated at the negative responses to his... Tomorrow's World took Trevor down to the BBC World Service. We're meeting Mick Delap uh, of the African factories. section. We've had stories of people in Somali refugee camps, for instance, saving up their rice rations 
and bartering it for for batteries. So you think there really is a market? I think there's a tremendous market if it can be, uh, if it can work. Um, <laughs> Trevor's persuaded us that it does. <laughs> but also, it, obviously, if, if it's marketed at, at an affordable price. But of course, Trevor still has to find the money to manufacture his radio. Until then, Trevor... I came home one evening and turned on the television. I was halfway through a Tomorrow's World. I suddenly thought, I can help this person. I know how to do this. I, mean, I wasn't turning it on specifically to watch it. But as I saw the story unfold and Trevor having more and more hardship trying to get, get his product noticed, I realised that I actually was in a position to help Trevor. I'd had a, number, a bit of experience in other product development and I saw all the elements coming together before me as the programme unfolded. It's OK. Um, that's enough, Sebastian. Chris Staines is an accountant with considerable experience of what can make or break a commercial venture. On the Sunday after the Tomorrow's World broadcast, he went to see Trevor and made an offer that led to a deal. So I came round with my wife and children and um, met Trevor and he immediately showed me the clockwork radio which I'd seen on the Tomorrow's World programme. It was, you know, it, was, it was a very amicable atmosphere. Trevor had a few people around and it was all very low-key and friendly. Whoa! What a ginormous boy! <laughs> it was the way I wanted it to be. I certainly didn't want to come in here with a suit and bowl Trevor over and saying this is how it's going to be done. So it, it was um, a measured approach, I'd say. Next stop, Africa, where Trevor believed his invention was needed. The whole idea was greeted enthusiastically by Chris Stain's South African business partner, Rory Steer. That is the midpoint. It was immediately apparent. He didn't even question what I'd said. He said, this is fantastic. This is for Africa. At that time, I was doing quite a lot of work in Tanzania on a mergers and acquisitions uh, deal that I was working on and had recently been to Mwanza, which is where the United Nations was flying in a lot of their aid to Rwanda at the time and uh, I was absolutely convinced that, that anything that uh, obviated the need for electricity or batteries on a continent of 600 million people was most certainly going to be beneficial. News of the invention was now spreading and a radio station in Johannesburg ran the story. It was heard by the head of Liberty Life, a foundation that invests in projects and gives away five million pounds of its profits a year to worthwhile causes. I was driving along in my car and I heard an interview on the radio with who subsequently turned out to be Jeffrey Bayless. The man on the radio was talking about a radio that used no batteries, solar power, or any other source. And I was enormously struck by the relevance that this had to South Africa. We have a country where the vast majority of people are rural and most people are poor and most people don't have access to electricity. Liberty Life seemed like an ideal investor, so Rory went to see Hilton Applebaum. I knew that he was becoming very interested in companies that uh, would make a social difference um, and where the profits generated could be returned to the community at large. Um, and therefore, Hilton wouldn't have been a rapist as so many other um, investors would be, where the, the, the money always wants ultimate control of the project. And we took it along to Hilton, and he was very positive from the start. He saw the project for what it really was. Intrigued by the idea, Hilton Applebaum travelled to Britain, saw that the radio worked, and met Trevor. I found him to be an incredibly exciting thinker, a man who thinks laterally, who sees the possibilities in everything, and that was extraordinarily exciting. In fact, it was at that meeting that I started exploring the question of could disabled people assemble this radio? I got in contact with Dr. William Rowland, who is a friend, a colleague, and an internationally respected leader of the disability movement. William is blind and he immediately said, I see. I just thought, what an amazing idea and how obvious. And I immediately felt that this was something that was, that was going to work. You know, we get many suggestions, many approaches for fundraising, for involving us with all kinds of things. This just made immediate sense to me. 
it's very easy for us as fully abled people to be able to say of the blind, well, let them weave baskets. The same skill that it takes to weave a basket, you can actually assemble a radio or many other higher value commodities. Higher value economically and higher value when it comes to your own self-esteem. Hilton Applebaum offered to fund a group of organizations for the disabled if they became business partners in the venture. They did, Liberty Life put up a total of three quarters of a million pounds and the project was on its way. Out on the road, Chris and Rory decided to find out just what the customer would want from a clockwork radio. So, with a local guide, they set off to do some market research. You see, we think in a year, somebody will spend 120 rand on batteries in one year. So they buy a battery every two weeks, every three weeks, it costs you 120 rand. So in one year, it's very, very expensive. So if you take a normal FM radio which costs, say, 50 rand, then that plus one year's batteries cost you 170 rand. Okay, I think it's a good idea about a bigger radio. A bigger one? The bigger the radio, the better the sound. Ah, okay. So this is a wind-up radio that's been invented by a guy in the UK. It doesn't need any batteries at all. We in New South Africa are very fond of the radios. Now the idea is that you wind it for about 30 seconds and it plays for about an hour. Do you think it's enough for one wind? You wind it up. So you have to rewind it every, every... hour. You have to wind it again. Ah. What do you think? You can stretch it for about two hours and be more. Um, we can make it play for as long as people want, but it makes it makes the radio more expensive because it has to have a bigger spring in. A bigger and if it becomes spring, more yes. expensive, then they say, no, I'd rather buy the one with the ah. batteries. So it's like a choice between the two. But it won't need a battery. It likes but it doesn't need batteries. This is just to, to show you the principle of it. No, no, this is it's nothing. It doesn't use any battery or anything. It's a good idea. It's a good idea. Fabulous. That's very nice. That's very nice. Yeah, that's nice. We don't need batteries, we don't need electricity. That's super. Save electricity. I like it. I like it. Bigger? Smaller? No, I would like it uh, as big as this. But bigger? A big one. Bigger, a little bit bigger. I like it to be loud. Not too loud. Loud. You can sell it uh, uh, to 150 because you're not using the battery. To buy 199 rand for... I will buy a radio like this. You people with all these inventions, it's good. I like modern science. Thank you. What do you think? Any interest? Batteries are such an issue in their lives that they definitely understood the benefits of... Uh, of the wind-up technology against having to purchase batteries on an ongoing basis. The other good news was the size. Did you see the size and the weight? The bigger and the heavier it is, the more they value the product. In fact, the better price we could get if we make it bigger and heavier. Yeah. Whereas I thought we had a problem with trying to miniaturize the thing. What we're going to have to do is make it big, heavy, very robust, and be able to play very loud. Trevor's original idea played for about 14 minutes with a two-minute wind, and it clearly wasn't a product. To take it from there all the way through to being a product was incredibly hard, and every single element of the, of the prototype had to be improved and examined and measured, and then put into a manufacturable form so we could actually make it into a product, and that was incredibly difficult. Bristol traffic still running well, though you can expect it to start picking up now. Measuring everything was what they were doing down at Bristol University Electronic Engineering Department. The prototype radio was there, having every component checked for its effectiveness, so that it could meet the needs of the potential customers. To see how they were getting on, Chris Staines visited Bristol with a new member of the team, David Butlian. He was in charge of the technical development of the radio and wanted to know just how loud it could play. So I gave him a ring. Okay. However, when they met the head of the project, Dr Duncan Grant, the news wasn't good. You can hear the tone that it's producing. If we increase the loudness by a small amount, you can see how much the current increases. So demanding more loudness means that you're requiring quite a lot more power and you're requiring to restore a lot more energy in the spring. 
you aren't going to do it. With the radio you've given us to test, you cannot have any more loudness. It's impossible. Well, when Chris phoned me in Johannesburg that night, uh, the thought you'll never work in this town again was going through my mind. You don't bring a group like the Liberty Life organization to a project selling them on the fact of, 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 of its potential and the fact that it does exist and phone them up a bit later and say, look, we've already spent a lot of the huge amount of money you've invested, uh, but there is really no product at all. So for the next few days, we're, we're a very bleak time. Bristol University had been completely right. It was impossible to make the radio louder. The criteria they'd been given were far too strict. Every time the radio was turned up, the sound distorted. There was simply not enough power coming out of the generator to drive the electronics properly. In order to solve the problem, we decided we'd move the goalposts. The first thing we did was the spring we had asked them to utilize, we threw that out of the program, and we re replaced it with a spring twice that size, giving us twice the amount of energy. To get that energy to the generator, though, you need a gearbox. Bristol University had made them a Rolls-Royce version, highly efficient but made of metal and expensive to mass produce. They wanted to cut costs by using plastic. We made a, a plastic replica of the um, Bristol University gearbox, which wasn't quite up to the job. And it was with that plastic gearbox that I sat at three in the morning trying to develop a solution. Bob, last night I spent most of the night trying to figure out... The following morning I drove down to Farnborough to a firm of development engineers that we had been working with to test the idea out with them. Last night, and I'd like your opinion on whether you think this concept might work. We'll put it on the cage. Friction is the enemy here. The more friction there is, the less energy from the coil spring gets through to the generator. Friction occurs in the bearings at the end of the axles, so to reduce it, they simply cut down the number of bearings and axles. They tried out this design, and it worked. Without these scientists and engineers, it simply wouldn't have happened. Finding somebody to be enthusiastic about what potentially is a fairly cranky idea was quite unique. They were able to bring together all the elements that we needed, the right spring people, the gear people, the plastics people, um, the radio people, and keep the momentum going. By now, Chris and his team had changed the design of Trevor's prototype radio considerably. This could have caused friction of a different kind. I think the thing about uh, Chris Staines, I didn't feel that the, with, with this chap, he would rub me out. Now, you, you've got to remember, Chris is a very, very skillful man. He's uh, an acquisitions and mergers director or former director of a company. Now, obviously, um, he has all the professional skills that could, in fact, cripple me if he wanted to. But it's my trust in him which is all important, and hopefully his trust in me that I don't sell him short as well. Sometimes, you know, it's the inventor that's the cause of the problem because he has this terrible thing called ego, and it can sometimes get in the way. He often tries to run it all. And, of course, you've got to realise that inventors probably should keep to inventing and those that commercialise should keep to the commercialisation, but there should be a, a, a very skillful and a very decent bond made between the inventor and the person who makes it possible for him, making sure that when the money rolls in, the inventor is not rolled out. This summer, just over a year after Trevor first met his new partners, he travelled to South Africa to see the factory in Cape Town. I wasn't quite sure what I would come across. I wasn't sure whether it was going to be um, a shanty town affair. I really didn't know, but in fact it was in the posh part of town. You know, it is a magnificent city. <laughs> David! <laughs> oh, it's right. a lion, mate. Oh, it's terrific. Oh, look at that. Look! <laughs> I can't go in there. Go on. Look at that. She's loving it. Oh, look at this. Yeah, the next person is 
and that piece on. You know, the gang's going to be able to change jobs every now and again, are they? <laughs> you know, no, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Because I hate these guys to get, you know, sort of four to tears doing one job at a time, you know. <laughs> As the company that makes the clockwork radio is partly owned by organisations for the disabled, its policy is to mainly employ disabled people. Hey! This is it! Mine. In the past, Trevor has invented gadgets to help the disabled, so he's delighted his invention is now providing work for them. This link between the clockwork radio and the disabled was to lead to a meeting Trevor will never forget. It's very, very exciting, isn't it? Walter Sassouli, who was imprisoned with Mr Mandela, told us when they were in prison on Robben Island, they used to read the newspaper and they would see about disabled people uh, challenging the government on all kinds of issues and uh, even demonstrating and marching. And the, he said it was such an encouragement to them that even disabled people were resisting. And I think that perhaps Mr. Mandela's interest partly stems from that. He probably just has a very good feeling for the needs of disadvantaged people. And I think they're just here. Hello. Yeah, that's good. Uh, let them come and sit here. Just bring the chairs here. Yeah? This side. Uh, Mr. President, here is the wind up radio we've come to show you. Yeah. And we'll demonstrate it. And with me on my right is Trevor Bayliss, the in British inventor. I'll show the president how it actually works. This yeah, I'd, like, I'd like this the president is, to work it. This, is, this has got no, no electricity, mm -hmm. no batteries. And on the right-hand side is a winder. Oh, yes. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. Here you are, sir. Right. That's the tuning arrangement there. Uh-huh. Right. Try and get a decent okay. channel. I'm clear. Decent channel. No electricity, no battery. No electricity at all. No. Absolutely none. I find it very interesting. It's a fantastic achievement. You're so kind. And I'm very happy that uh, this uh, new and fantastic invention is associated uh, with uh, uh, people who have been despised by society. One of the things that uh, is impressive for today is the emergence of uh, men and women who are thinking in terms of uh, uh, the disadvantaged, like the right. poorest of the poor. I think he sees the potential for disabled people, but also I think he takes pride in the fact that South Africa is going to be the manufacturer and that our technology will be harnessed for the benefit of Africa. We have done very well. I hope that this invention of mine, um, it would be smashing if this piece of kit was available to those people that need it most. It would be very, <laughs> it'd be very nice to become extremely rich. On the other hand, having said that, you can only wear one suit at a time. And let's face it, I'm not too badly off as I am now. I, I hope that's not a signal to my, my colleagues to think that I, I wouldn't like to get rich too. I could never have developed what Trevor has developed or brought it to the attention he did. He has the tenacity to take it that far. But Trevor, being what he is, could never take it any further than that. No one would ever take him seriously. He wrote to every single organisation you could think of and was rejected out of hand. What he needed was somebody with the credibility to be able to take what they thought was a good idea to bring it to the attention of people who would then listen to them. And that's what I was able to do, to, take, to give credibility to what Trevor was doing because I believed in it, and I didn't have to, to, to lie about taking it forward. I genuinely thought it was a good idea. You know, the, in the factory in Cape Town, to look, um, to look through the door and see all those guys and girls, you know, working in their wheelchairs, on their crutches and something. Yeah, that was pretty good.
The Health Quest goes in search of Ruby's stress level next on BBC One. <laughs> Oh, we're going to have some fun with this, aren't we? You know, you're making me very proud, you know. Something. An operation that's carried out while the patient's conscious. Pioneering surgery to treat Parkinson's disease. QED returns in two weeks on BBC.